Oh, hey. Hey, Alice. Good timing. You walked in at a, an excellent time, actually. We got George Leoniak, uh, founder of the uh, New Geometry, uh, New Geometers Facebook page, and uh, also has the New Geometry YouTube channel. And he also offers apprenticeships uh, teaching geometry. And uh, we also have Danny here with us too. You remember Danny, Alice. What up? How are you guys doing tonight? Doing excellent. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, it's, it's absolutely my pleasure. Um, yeah. And yeah, Danny, Danny, thanks for coming back as well. Um, so you offer apprenticeships where you teach about geometry on your channel as well. Exactly. Yeah, the, that's one of the offerings. Uh, new geometry is just because, you know, people listening, they mostly think NEW new, like it's new geometry that way. But the key phrase of my uh, title there is KNEW geometry, right? Because I really feel that doing sacred geometry, not just geometry that we learned in high school or something, the KNEW part is the part that accesses the deep memory of the sacred geometry that's inside of us. And that stimulates some sort of seed, like let's just say some seed memory, seed atom, something like that, that you start to kind of relate to in a K and E W new way. Like you knew this stuff deep inside you. And that's really how I teach. You know, I don't go in there to try and teach. Like I teach techniques and I don't force a lot of opinions on people, but I let that allow them to experience the new geometry and go with it where it takes them. That's my approach. Nice. Um, I, I, so I guess I, I'm interested to know what got you on this path was, was there something, uh, was it kind of, um, uh, a progress leading up to there? Was there something that happened that got you on this path? Uh, yeah, quite a, quite a few stories. I mean, my background is, uh, I'm a, tr a wildlife tracker. So I spent a lot of many years for 20 something years, training people in the woods, teaching them to see wildlife sign invisible patterns in the landscape, of course all nature-based patterns. So I really developed a keen eye for observation, question, curiosity, like how to describe things descriptively. And, uh, you know, I'm constantly immersed in the world of sacred geometry, really. I didn't know it at the time. Um, but uh, eventually, I finally got to getting a compass, you know, only about five years ago. A compass, you know, for drawing circles and a straight edge. And wow, it just ignited. Like that was the timing for me. And the stimulus actually was, I was at the beach with my son. He was playing on the playground. All of a sudden this light shined through this grate and put the whole flower of life pattern like on the ground out of light and shadow. <laughs> and I was like, I recognize that pattern. I didn't really, I knew it was called flower of life at the time, but I never drew it. I never did anything like that. But seeing the light and the shadow reflection, I stood there for like five minutes mesmerized. You know, my son was pulling on my leg like, hey, what are you doing? <laughs> and then eventually I was like, I got to get sacred geometry book. And that night I bought a book, got the compass and started drawing. And ever since then, I've just been totally fully immersed in that process. Nice. Yeah. What, what is that? Um... What do, you, what do you make of that? Like seeing the light and the shadows in such a um, complicated, like uh, it, it should be random, but it almost, it seems like it's not random. Like what, how do you, how do you rectify that? Yeah, that's a good question, you know, because when I tell the story to people, it more is like, oh, you saw some light shine through some thing and it made this pattern. You know, that's one way of looking at it, but See, there are messages coming to us all the time in the simplest forms. It's not some far out distal thing that's going to be the clouds open up and somebody hovers in front of you. It might not be like that. It could be. <laughs> but it might be as simple as the light communicating to you in a way that resonates with you because it's all light, right? You know, we're all mm -hmm. made of light. Everything is light, electromagnetic spectrum, magnetism and electricity. And that is communicating to you. But do you have the awareness? Do you have the sensitivity to know, like internally, like that's telling you something more than just light and shadow. Like that's saying, this is something for you to explore and check out, you know? And, and that's where that comes in. And I guess, um, would you say in general, uh, complex geometry can be sort of a portal to knowledge? Like, um, is, is it, or... Is it in, is it circumstantial? Uh, I believe that 
it is a portal to knowledge. I think every design that you do is is kind of opening up a portal. Yeah. You know, when, you, when you draw that, the, the compass itself with the needle and the lead, right? I mean, most people are used to those crummy ones they had as a kid. You know, it's always moving out of line, you know, and you can't make a right circle. Yeah. But, you know, that needle is meant to be your consciousness. So when you're in the act of putting that needle on your paper, you have to have the utmost attention to project your awareness and consciousness at that point in the center, because that's the Bindu point, you know, as they call it, Hinduism, mm -hmm. Bindu, where all your focused attention is at that point. So you're really infusing your consciousness into this drawing. And if you do it in sacred geometry and sacred way of doing that, you're totally putting your, uh, your beingness and consciousness, fusing it with what that picture is going to represent, you know, and, 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 Typically, it represents interconnectivity, wholeness, patterns and relationships that can be found at multiple scales. So that's what you're diving into through that act. Mm -hmm. I got gotcha. you. The um, I've I've seen the uh, Tibetan ritual where they use the sand, you know, to make the uh, uh, like the picture, kind of like the one behind your head, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. and uh, yeah, like all 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 the kids and all the monks will come in and they'll circle around the table and every one of them's just staring at the one point where the guy's drawing it and they're all just tuned in to the same thing together and you know it's sort of a ritual. Uh, it's a beautiful thing if you ever get to to see it. Uh, it's very moving, but yeah, it it seems like the Tibetans recognize that that point that you're talking about, like represents the integration of, of consciousness, you know, um, I believe so. <laughs> oh yeah, no, I'm with you on that. I mean, that's, uh, that's part of why I feel so moved to share this with, mm -hmm. with, with people through my own experience and, um, uh, Anybody could do it. You know, it's not anything special that I'm doing, although I've, I've introduced some really interesting techniques that I think make it really enjoyable, fun, a lot of freedom, a lot more creativity can come, getting over those hurdles of like, hey, I was never an artist, I'm not creative, I never draw, you know, and just mm -hmm. kind of really letting go of those things and like being like, whoa, wow, I'm really connecting with this. And then it takes over and it just becomes an inspiration. And so there's like, there's healing components within that. And there's that awareness. There's so many multiple layers going on. It's, it's really hard to describe it all. It's really a journey. It can only really be, uh, you know, kind of experienced. And it's only really ready for when you're ready for it. Because if you try to force it too soon, it might just feel like I'm drawing a kind of a funny looking picture. <laughs> so, you know, it sounds like, I'm really oh, sorry, I was just gonna say, it sounds like with geometry, like a, a huge part of it is, um, the creation of it because it sounds like there's something uh, meditative and spiritual about the development of something it probably i imagine helps you with the understanding of that thing also rather than looking at the finished product knowing the steps it takes to to create that yeah and you know it's like a musician once you start to know the basics then you start jamming with it and when a musician doesn't have to think about their scales anymore so all of a sudden you start drawing these circles and these lines and you start to see the patterns of how they connect and you're less in your mind right you're not thinking like this goes to here, that goes to there. It just becomes like definitely like you're just jamming away and you're not thinking about where your fingers or what you're, what's going on. Your body's almost sensually, tactically getting engaged in this. And then you're transcending the words of even what the image is. There's no more words being involved in that. So you're really uh, having a spiritual experience, you know, in, in this way, because you're in that flow state. You know, you're connecting with the parts of beingness that gets out of the logic side of things. And yeah. More yeah. Intuitive. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It, uh, it takes, it takes over like a trance almost, you know, like drawing a lot of your forms, George, uh, like, like you, as I, as I attempt to draw, like a lot of the pictures that I've drawn, uh, that I've learned from you, like it, like you find the pattern. And then it's like you just start going around the design and like adding the same line and then the next one and you, you know, you got to follow a pattern you just get into that rhythm like you're saying. Mm. And I mean, it, it's like a trance state really self inducing trance and uh, it has a lot of uh, therapeutic properties for sure. Yeah, I mean, you know, I think the interesting thing is, is that like you see a very complex pattern, but you realize that comp pattern as you're saying is really just repeating the same simple step 
over and mm -hmm. over again and to complete the drawing. So you mm -hmm. show someone at the end of it who wasn't part of the process of making at it, they're like, whoa, dang, that's really complex. You know, a lot of the mm -hmm. stuff I post on Facebook is really complex, but really it's just staying with the focus of doing a kind of repetitive process, you know, and following that pattern. And that's usually where people can check out because it's easy to let the mind wander. It's like, I'm just repeating the same thing to create this. Either that gets mm -hmm. boring or you move on to something else. So that's where that kind of uh, one-pointed focused attention, right, comes mm -hmm. into play, you know, so that every act is a new act. It's not repetitive. And that's a big difference in, in consciousness really is every little step you're taking is not that you've done it 20 times before. Every new pencil stroke is a new action. So now you yeah. can just say the Zen of it or something like that, right? Yeah. Yeah. It takes, you definitely have to be like fully conscious of like sitting your pen down, like how much pressure you have on your ruler. Like, like I've been meditating for, a, for a while now, pretty seriously. Mm -hmm. And, and it's like a wonderful form of meditation, you yeah. know, and controlling your, controlling your awareness it's and, applied you know it's an applied meditation so you're engaged with something so that does help the mind kind of ease into it for people who have a hard time just sitting completely still um mm -hmm. so it acts in that same way and yeah it's just it's really um i had, a, had one little thought there of what you said danny that kind of just escaped me i thought it was uh totally related to that maybe we'll come back you know <laughs> the, uh, anyway uh, keep going i'll, I'll it'll come yeah. back i think it so um like I bet being able to create or I get not being able to, but having made one of those shapes, like you're saying, like, it sounds complex to uh, a third party, but once you've done that, like it's, a, it's a, like, it changes your perspective on how you look at that thing because you see it as not something as you see it as not uh, as intricate because you understand the steps. So would you say it like permanently changes the way you look at that? Kind of, like, I guess the way that we look at the world, maybe. Yeah, well, remember, we're dealing with the 2D plane there. So it's mm. flat, right? Okay. Yeah. But a lot of the geometry that I share with people is to look at it three dimensionally, or try to look at it as a fourth dimensional object and what other forms are actually in there. So when I look at these drawings now, you know, if you don't know what actually you're looking at, it will just look like a bunch of lines in a design. But if you start to really know what that is, you're like, that's a platonic solid. That's this shape that's in there, right? And then all of a sudden you're pulling that up in your mind's eye, right. another you know, mind training mind's eye to visualize these shapes in your mind's eye. Then you're like, wow, I look at that and I'm talking to this other person and we're talking about this as a three dimensional object, which is just flat. It's like you could pull it up off the page and see around it. And that's a, that's a unique part of the training you know, of doing sacred geometry, especially when it's not just about pretty pictures and designs, it becomes more of the, uh, the building blocks of creation, let's just say, you know, the building blocks of creation, the platonic solids, the other forms that are contained within some of those classic drawings. It's really a template to hold those forms or, or else it is just, just art for itself, right? It, but this is a little different because it can be art and it can also be these fundamental shapes that are going to be found in cells, galaxies, you know, at atomic structures. It's like that's crystal structures, crystalline structure, right? I mean, it's this is what we're really talking about. And these patterns are actually containing that. Now, that's well known in some instances, but it takes some real practice to engage for you to for another person to start to engage and really appreciate that. You know, you could be told that and be like, oh, that that's what that supposed to mean but to really engage and appreciate at that level you take on a whole nother relationship with it hmm. it's like putting on 3d goggles or 4d goggles you get like invisible sight into things let's just say because of that you know because you could see hmm. into the structure with your how, minds up how is um how is following this rabbit hole of geometry helped you both in um like in life like how how you operate hmm. You want to talk, Danny? I know I've been going on. You, Danny, Danny's been, uh, you know, but how long have you been doing geometry, like it, sacred geometry before you um, with me? So I, uh, I study like Hebrew literature and I had an experience back when I was like 22 and 
uh it was sort of an outer body experience i mean i don't care how i sound anymore like i'll just tell the truth about my experience you know like and i really had this one and uh and i saw the inside shape of the seed of life and it was part of this grand vision that i'll skip for now but i'd never heard of the seed of life at all i didn't know what it was i was like a six-pointed star you know and but i'd been a, a you know i've been a scholar like since i was a kid you know and uh mm -hmm. So I started to see the hexagon like coming out in Jewish literature in relationship to the menorah, the seven candlestick, and in relationship to how the, the 12 tribes camped in Israel, you know, and so I got obsessed with the Star of David, like from a theological point of view, and I didn't hear about sacred geometry as like an art form or that it existed until 2016, mm -hmm. and, uh, and I saw... Uh, I don't know, it was some wacky video on the internet, but, uh, but, you know, I got extremely intrigued, but I never really took it very, very far until uh, I met you, you know, and like, suddenly, like, you know, all of this great stuff kind of blossomed out of it, you know, but, uh, and it's transforming how I understand Hebrew literature uh, completely, and it's actually so integrated into the way that they wrote stories like you know i mean i'm writing a book about it because it's just so massive of a subject you know but but yeah like i mean they would make geometric forms and instead of writing lines they'd write text of hebrew and they're advertising what their literature is supposed to do they're creating a form and putting the spirit of the word into it you know so they're possessing it with this consciousness you know and like that's what's supposed to happen to you and you read the book you're like that geometric form and you're full of the word you know mm -hmm. so like as far as geometry in my my life you know like it's completely integrative to a lot of other fields of knowledge you know and it's just causing all of this information to like you know coalesce together yeah. um but um and then it changes the way you see nature, I feel, you know, because I'm constantly meditating and, and looking at animals and insects and stuff, you know, and something about geometry just kind of changes the way you see form and structure. I don't know. Mm -hmm. Like, I mean, that's part of like the forefront of my journey, you know, but like, yeah, like pine cones and the way trees, branches comes out and stuff. You, I don't know. It seems like there's like a geometric network behind how matter manifests in this realm, you know, and I feel like geom sacred geometry kind of. It's like there's a sense to all the chaos and it kind of gives you like a peephole into that, I guess. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, yeah, like a language. You? Yeah. What about you, George? How has this helped you um, in your life? Yeah, well, like I said, I mean, uh, this last bit you were talking about nature, it's like I really kind of reversed engineered my approach here because, I mean, like I said, I was really steeped in doing all the nature exploration and observation and then kind of applied it to sacred geometry patterns. And it was kind of like a no brain, you know, it was just like, oh, well, here's what I've been looking for in, in my, uh, let's just say, uh, formal education. <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. I wasn't getting that in formal education, you know, so I did all the biology and tracking and you know wilderness observation stuff and but geometry and math and everything i was like no way i can't do this you know in mm -hmm. school you know i was mm -hmm. the worst i was the worst yes. i had to teach myself all that stuff after the fact <laughs> you know in my uh, 40s uh, or yeah. early late 30s i had to teach myself everything that i share in my videos i didn't know any of that stuff <laughs> You know, so, but because of the strong pattern recognition and the ability to teach myself and learn and observe and ask questions and follow trail, tracking is like the focus of consciousness on a one point type thing. I had that going on, you know, because that was all part of tracking. That was like, you got to have some serious focus and attention to find that next track, that next footprint. I mean, all your attention and consciousness is on that. So, you know, I, I was able to apply that, but how has it changed since that? Well, you know, it, it's, uh, it, it, it's kind of, uh, let's see, it's brought me deeper into that understanding. It's actually helped me integrate with society a little bit more, as weird as that sounds. <laughs> you know, because these are patterns that anybody can associate with. But when I start talking tracking, most people are like, whoa, that's way out there. Yeah. You know, sacred geometry is symbolically uh, referenced in 
religious iconography, churches, temples, uh, his, historically layouts of towns. I mean, it's like part of our pattern language, like how natural humans, you know, start to relate with their environment is through building with these patterns in natural ways, you know, because they want to mm-hmm. embed themselves in that natural system. And if they're built on that tradition, they'll follow those patterns rather than a lot of the other stuff we're doing. <laughs> Mm-hmm. you know so so actually the sacred geometry has helped me kind of integrate with people and a population of people to share my other gifts that i developed you know through this kind of off in the wilderness alone type guy <laughs> to be yeah. able to be like hey now i got a pattern language where i can kind of interface and share those experiences in a way that connects to the wholeness that these patterns represent which i experience in nature so it's actually been like like uh that part of my teaching evolution and also like a healing journey to feel like i'm more integrated in society even though it's still kind of a fringe topic (laughs) i wouldn't Mm -hmm. be doing podcasts with guys like you you know i wouldn't have met Mm -hmm. the vast majority of people that come to the apprenticeships it was Mm -hmm. a very minute little small group of people so then i just see the unification unity that those patterns bring people with diverse sets of skills backgrounds ethnicity you know those patterns are so universal and kind of bringing us together that it transcends a lot of that stuff you know in many cases in other cases it could cause you know religious dogma and protection of symbols sure and that's you know in some of that but i I call it the religion trap and like you know it's the trap's always there and it only takes a second to fall in but what yeah, what you're yeah. saying about like connecting more with people too i think what what you said at the beginning about why um why you decided to call it new geometry or new new geometers is like yeah. it <laughs> it is something that one like it connects with you on a primal like instinctual level like it's in your brain already like you mm-hmm. were saying um so maybe that's why it helps connect people because it's like we all know this deep down and yeah. it's like you're you're just helping people remember really exactly the geometry is i mean you know i'm just keep presenting different ways of saying the same thing sure. different things something in there might catch a hold of someone and they'll get excited about it and that might take them down this rabbit hole like you're mentioning a little bit further and it will ignite that remembering that's why it's a k and ew funny thing is, is i actually mm-hmm. started out the first name of my oldest videos i was saying I actually called it k and ew spirituality you know, a remembering mm-hmm. of spirituality because the spirituality component is, you know, really like what this is targeting. And then I was like, I got to tone that back a bit so I can actually be more inclusive to mm. people who don't just shy away from spirituality. Yeah. Like they got a little too pigeonholed. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Geometry is a little bit more broad based. It had the sacred geometry connection, but you know, that's really uh, when you hit that new miss memories, you start to find parts in yourself that relate to a deeper sense of uh, connection maybe called spirituality different type of experiences related to that you know that's really important stuff mm-hmm. and, but so I, I did change the name um, but that was good because it was actually a good growth and acceleration after doing that yeah it was more yeah yeah, yeah I, th- I know what you mean about like uh maybe that branding like nothing wrong with it but maybe it, it's a little more pigeonholed like you said whereas like geometry is like people you can get like a wider net of people to to like and then you, all these people find out that they're not all that different because they're coming together on this subject yes yeah. yeah and then the spirituality if it emerges it emerges on its own because i wasn't really intending to try to establish a new spirituality yeah <laughs> Let, let that be for everybody's own unique expression of how that wants to express rather than all of a sudden say, I've got to tie all this iconography to some spiritual traditions, you know, it really gets messy, you know, because yeah, there yeah. Are already a lot of traditions. So uh, yeah. just really focus on the geometry and letting that be the uh, carrier of the message. Then it really takes, you know, the personalized component out of it, you know, still being sensitive culturally, but it does allow for more organic nature for it to just resonate where anybody's at on their path, regardless yeah. of what tradition they like to follow. Yeah. Yeah. I don't get that luxury being into Hebrew literature, you know, 
like <laughs> it's just going to be really sensitive for people but but I do kind of take a similar approach by focusing on structures in the literature and focusing on like the act like what's actually in the text and not I don't know once you start getting into literary structures like these are true forms like that the writer built you know so it's like a connection to the author you know and and I consider that kind of like a backstage pass into their purpose for the book you know but there's mm -hmm. this uh philosopher I really like that you guys are reminding me of right now um his name's Kalindi Lee I, he's still alive I'm pretty sure but um he um his whole thing is he takes enormous amounts of psilocybin mushrooms and he looks at complex geometry and he talks about how uh certain there are certain things you can look at to directly access the akashic record which is like an access of all knowledge past present and future um and he says it has to do with a correlation between like uh these heightened mindsets and geometry uh Marcus Aurelius uh, actually talked about being able to access all knowledge, past and future. Really? Uh, coincidentally enough, I was just talking to my uncle about that a couple days ago. Yeah. Hmm. I, I have the quote. Actually, you want to look it up? Yeah, I got it. I, my uncle, uh, like, we had a really good conversation, and uh, he was like, "I'll send you the picture of the page" because it was about uh, a lot of my research we were talking about. Uh, should be right here uncle scott i love my uncle he's a good guy shout out to uncle scott <laughs> yeah shout out to uncle scott let's see here um but yeah the the uh, kashik record i believe is like that's that's an old uh vedic uh idea it, it, that's that's something's been floating around with us in our tradition for a while too um just sort of this idea of a perfect library i think um there's something about that ideal i really like <laughs> well i mean i really i mean i think sacred geometry is a good way to think think about that because i don't believe anything is really ever lost and it's part of that field see i mean a, a lot of things that i work with at sacred geometry i've never really seen anybody else do so I'm like, where am I getting from this? I mean, yeah, maybe I'm just being creative, but hey, I might have a dream. I might have some intuitive insight. I, you know, you don't know where it comes from, but maybe somebody did this thousands and thousands of years ago. We just don't know. <laughs> so everything's in that etheric field, right? It's all in that, that field that can be accessed. And sometimes you don't need to know where it comes from, but it's you didn't make it up. <laughs> mm -hmm. you, yeah. You, you're not like the sole reason this is... Uh, the, why why it's here i mean maybe you might bring it forth but you know you're not the one who is the uh, originator of this it's yeah. it already mm -hmm. exists out there you know that's, that's the way i relate to it that's what's uh, like, kind of fascinating about like um the sciences and the maths is like it's a discovery not an invention and if we and we make changes to it so what we find out is when we originally discovered it we were wrong about how it worked so it's like but it is a it's a discovery. It's not something we come up with. Like like you're saying, it's like that didn't come from you. There's something like divinely true about this. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. The uh, yeah, like the the geometric form. Like when you create a geometric form, or like George uh, entangling these complex geometric forms together. Like they fit together because it's true in the universe you know what i mean it represents a truth you know if these forms actually all align and, and fit together it's because it, it's real somehow you know yeah like, and that's where i find a real spiritual element in it like you know because it geometry is truth in a way it's a language of truth you know hmm. uh, uh, sorry i had a I, call coming in sorry I, I don't know if that messed you up keep going okay. please uh, I got that uh, Marcus, Marcus Aurelius quote, uh, yeah, which he's, he's kind of joining our conversation, not, which I love, but he says, further, the rational soul traverses the whole universe in its surrounding void, 
explores the shape of it, stretches into the infinity of time, encompasses and comprehends the periodic regeneration of the capital whole. It reflects that our successors will see nothing new, just as our predecessors saw nothing more than we do, such as the sameness of things. A man of 40 with understanding whatsoever has, has a sense seen all the past and all the future. Yeah. Mm. So he's kind of joining our conversation there. Yeah, I mean, that, you know, that's it's doing sacred geometry in this the way that I've been doing is the closest I've really come to really kind of having a sense of, uh, of relating to that. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. That's what it really feels like, because it's different than like something I think I'm just coming up creatively like this is cool. I'm following some real lawful principles, you know, creating stuff based on those. Uh, Frank has used the word lawful. Uh, Frank Chester, uh, he's a... Oh geometer mentor uh you know i don't have a real serious mentor but i have a connection with him he's fantastic he created the chestahedron yeah I, I wanted to ask you how you met him i was going to bring that up uh in a minute whenever it was a good time so so by all means like how'd you get involved with frank chester yeah okay i'll get to that in a sec but you know he he said uh you know two of the things that just came up basically first first thing he asked me is you know the difference between a discovery and an invention <laughs> which you were just talking about <laughs> you brought up the same thing to me because you know he was talking about the chestahedron is this was a discovery you know this, this is a seven-sided form no one created it where did it come from it's a discovery he didn't invent this you know yeah <laughs> it, it was something that inventions come after the fact of a discovery where they keep modifying that discovery yeah. over time with little tweaks and things right so yeah frank frank uh frank is really uh He's an amazing geometer. I was lucky to connect with him. And I had his books years ago. He really got me into building sculptural forms just from looking at his books. Because he was a, he was a geometer who really um, uh, accessed that creativity, right? You know, he pushed the envelope in different areas. He tried new things. He kind of followed different elemental rules. He was kind of inspiring people to do that. And it wasn't like, this is the way it's done. This is the way they did it. It's always going to be that way. You know, he's accessing that other knowledge base that comes through this Marcus Aurelius quote here, you know? Mm -hmm. So I was just inspired by that. And then I started doing Chestahedron videos and I sent it to Frank, just like, maybe he'll contact me. And immediately that night he called me up, you know? Oh and man. He was like, this is the best video you know i've seen on it you're the only person who's done anything with my work in all these years you know has really tried to do it and then he started giving me little like breadcrumb trails to follow you know he's mm -hmm. like here take a look at this picture in my book he's like why don't you check that out i think you're going to really be uh, you know interested in what you might find there so then i puzzle over this picture and have to draw the circles try to figure it out and i'd be like whoa i'd call him back up and be like frank i can't believe it that that was exactly the phi ratio circles that I've been talking about. You did that already. You know, he was already doing phi ratio circles back then. Not in the way I do it, but I was on the trail he was because we were accessing similar <laughs> bandwidths at different times and different places, but we were kind of moving together parallel until we came together and met up and started talking about this stuff. So, you know, it's encouraging when you meet people like that who are kind of accessing that same frame of reference like the hundredth monkey or something they're doing it over there and you're doing it over here well how are you communicating <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah you know? and that, that's um, what happens uh, uh, frank chester is sort of connected to how i found out about you george uh, like my uncle scott uh he gave me a book called the power of now and it was at a time in my life to where i had kind of reached a dead end with like a lot of suffering you know and I thought the book sounded really corny, but when I read it, like I learned, like I understood meditation. I had known of meditation and kind of had a relationship with it, but like Eckhart Tolle caused me, it just opened up my practice, kind of like you opened up sacred geometry for me in a whole new way. And uh, it, it changed my whole understanding of, of scripture, you know, having this meditative awakening and uh and I'm starting chasing these these number patterns down that are hidden in cryptography. And I don't know, num I'm not great with numbers. So I'm like, you know, sounding like a madman. I'm like, you know, three, six, five, and four. And, it, you know, and I'm talking to my uncle and he's like, dude, you got to check out this guy, Frank Chester's work. You know, 
And he's like, this guy's doing geometry on the heart. Maybe it's got something to do with that, you know? And uh, so I watched his, uh, his like two hour presentation on the chestahedron, you know, that he gave to some medical students and stuff. And that, that's an amazing video, like yeah. by all means. And, uh, but uh, at the same time I watched that, uh, I had saved your video on YouTube that said the five platonic solids aren't in Metatron's cube because I was going down that Metatron's cube rabbit hole. Uh, and uh, I was like, oh, th uh, somebody that hates sacred geometry is what I thought when I saw the title. And I was like, I'll save that for later just to, you know, hear a naysayer. And uh, when I, I watched it like three weeks later and it was incredible, you know, your work with Metatron finding out Metatron's cube doesn't have the five platonic solids. That's incredible stuff, man. Like it's revolutionary. And, uh, and then it, I, so I started watching your videos and then you got videos of Frank Chester. I'm like, man, that is so crazy. Like, <laughs> hey, so I won't, yeah. I won't ask you to break it down all the way. Cause that'd be a lot, but like, um, so basically you, you have like realized that Metatron's cube does not actually contain all the platonic solids, but there is a shape that does oh yeah yeah oh, definitely i've come up with a lot of different ways to do it okay. you know you know because metatron's cube if you this is one thing if you say that this has it and it definitively has it what one thing it does is it stops people from actually looking anymore to make to, to test it out you see okay so once i kind of was asking questions checking out the math and then realized that it wasn't true i was like in denial you know because <laughs> This is the thing that is posted around all over saying like, this is the, the blueprint of creation, you know, mm, it is, yep. and all the great other geometers out there are posting this. It's in almost every book, you know? Mm, so when yeah. I, started, I was like, Whoa, this is mind blowing. And then yep. I went on the quest of like, well, how do I find out how to rectify this? You know, like, is there a solution? Is it going to be, what do I need to add to do this? You know? So mm -hmm. I, really had to change my perspective, draw from some different views, integrate, learn a lot about the phi ratio because the two platonic solids that weren't in it are ones related to phi ratio. Now that's the golden ratio, you know, divine proportion, uh, found all in nature. Those are the icosahedron, which is the 20-sided die if you're a D, you know, D and D person. <laughs> the 12-sided die, right, the D12. That's the, yeah. uh, you know, dodecahedron. Well, those two forms weren't in it because the phi ratio was not representing the pattern. So we were misrepresenting them. Huh. I mean, my videos, you could like watch the progression of like how I was working this out, yeah. you know, and keep refining it and refining it and refining it, like keep going back to it until I was starting to create all these other forms that were like hidden from us, you know, from most of the people in geometry, like you know, stellated forms that were in there, the five-pointed uh, point set Kepler things, like things that amazing uh, historical figures, astronomy, you know, different people throughout history are like way into these. But meanwhile, we're not really accessing them. And it's like off in some academic corner, you know, mm -hmm. and we don't really know how to get that into our mainstream. You know, they maybe you just see a picture of it, but you don't have a real conscious connection to it. It might look cool, but when you draw it, you start to relate to it in a different way. You start to see it in the culture, and now you have that relationship with it. And, and it's like really, uh, it really, really changes you. And the, the, like, uh, the connection to Phi to like how like or, organisms start from a single cell and then turn into a whole organism you know like there's a relationship to phi and how they replicate you know yeah. and there's a physicist who they kind of buried his work but he was a, he was a real physicist he was the real deal robert j moon and he was saying that the platonic solids and phi govern the quantum world and Kepler was saying that it governs outer space and that the orbits of the planets and the distance from other stars is all governed by phi, you know, like. Well, I mean, and, just, uh, you've been on that trail and like you sent me those pictures of quantum entanglement, right? And mm -hmm. I had last summer seen another picture of quantum entanglement and I put the golden circles, that means the small phi ratio circle, mm -hmm. into the bigger one. And I mm -hmm. put it over top of this image that had like two kidney bean shapes. And I was like, in one of my presentations, I think it was called uh, 
it's sacred geometry at all scales. Thank God. That was the name of the presentation. <laughs> I talk about this. I talk about this and I put the five circles. I'm like, you know what? I think that this quantum entanglement picture is related to phi ratio because of the proportion I see there. And then Danny just sent me another more detailed image. And we took the whole golden circle seed of life. This is what I call one of these fruit patterns. Is it's a seed of life, which is six circles around one, you yeah. know, and that's the seed of life, classic image in sacred geometry. And then I put phi ratio circles in each of the circles. And that actually turned out to be the quantum entanglement pictures. And I have, I have them in the slideshow here if we ever want to look at it. But, and then all of a sudden I was like, wow, I've been working with and sharing this quantum entanglement. It's like we've gone into evolution from like thinking everything was just the material world back in the 1900s. They didn't even know about the quantum world. It all came about. We thought it was totally Newtonian physics, right? It was all, uh, you know, if I did this action, it would happen at this physical level. We could predict everything on the physical level easily but until you got to that quantum level. Well, this is where our sacred geometry is going to. You see, it's going past the kind of Newtonian perspective and now getting into this quantum entanglement pattern. That's the way I kind of am relating to it, you know, because our sacred geometry is going to evolve with the science. But if the science leaves that behind, then the rest of the community, like the people, <laughs> are out mm -hmm. of the picture. You see, it's it, yeah. it becomes a divide. This is the bridge, you know, sacred geometry is the bridge between that advances in science and the people the artisans the people who are just uh, living it's like you got to have some interface to have symbology represent your worldview in a way you know? mm -hmm. if it's quantum entanglement and it's all these complex patterns well then that matches but if your worldview is back 2000 3000 years ago of just two tetrahedrons <laughs> well meanwhile they're way off in the quantum entanglement string theory world there's a pretty big disconnect between right. those two extremes, you know? Yeah. So this, the sacred geometry has got to advance, and that's kind of my, you know, quote-unquote uh, mission in what I'm doing with new geometers is to kind of, at, at least that's what it's presenting it, is I get further into it. It's like, this is important stuff. It has that ability to keep people access with the current, you know, evolution of our understanding of the universe and make it mm -hmm. really, like, down to earth, I can relate to this because the imagery I'm seeing around me is reflecting those things. And even though I don't understand what they're saying, this image right here resonates with that connection. Hmm. You know? Yeah. And, and when you see like uh, like particle imaging, you know, and, and these represent like waves moving through a field, you know, but particle imaging, like it's all a bunch of geometric forms, like advanced geometric forms. And I mean, that's that one of the most exciting feelings. Like, you know, when you see that, you're like, whoa, that's what makes me, that's what makes my body, you know? And like, and it's these like amazing pictures. Like, I don't know. Like, I mean, when I draw geometric forms, like I, I stare at them all the time. <laughs> like I, I get bored. I just like start staring at them and it's, they're amazing, you know? And yeah, you know the cymatics, you know the vibration images, you see a lot of those out, you know, where Oh, that's insane. Like yeah. it looks the same like the photons images, like exactly. <laughs> now you're drawing that. So what do you think's happening to your relationship with that when you're actually mm -hmm. you know, when I was doing a lot of tracking, people would always say, draw the leaf, draw the track, you know, because when you're drawing it, your eye is connecting with through your body and your hand in a way that is forging a relationship you know yeah. from drawing from that other side of the, the brain you know and so there's there's definitely some activity that helps in that process you know that's actually an uh, to engage in yeah that's like extending the energy of your attention outside of your body and it having an integration with the form outside of you you know like because mm -hmm. that you know like a leaf is an energy form and that energy is traveling with light light bouncing off of it into your eye you know so there's a relationship between it as a separate thing and then this one energy movement that's going all the way into your being and you you know when you draw it you're like guiding that energy form through your body as a channel you know and yeah. giving it life inside of you and on a piece of paper you know yeah 
I, hey, Alex, do you want to chime in on anything? You know, you've been, uh, we've been yeah. kind of going back and forth here for a minute. I, I was, um, I was about to, but I was enjoying the conversation also. Like, yeah, oh, <laughs> but um, um, I, I was going to say um, it's something we're figuring out as people over the last um, hundreds of thousands of years since we've been here is that there seem, at least as far as we can tell, as far as I can tell, there are boundaries, there are restrictions, there are limitations to physics, to reality. Um, and something we've been doing for, you know, throughout our entire history is finding out what those boundaries and rules are. Because with, by definition, that because there's boundaries, that means that the universe operates a certain way, meaning it doesn't operate another way. So mm -hmm. I think like what this like what you guys are talking about and like geometry and the maths overall what they're doing is finding those those boundaries and so i think um part of what what makes this conversation and like geometry co conversations about geometry so important overall is that it's helping us understand like how how things work mm. um and that's why it, i think it resonates with people and why it's also so familiar, like a deja vu kind of thing as well. Mm -hmm. And I guess I would like to speak on that, that aspect. Uh, what, why is it that these concepts kind of like, ah, yes, like, why didn't I see that sooner? What, what is it about that that makes us feel that way? Um, is it that we retain knowledge from our ancestors? Like, is that what our instincts are? Is it that you're ancestor came across a, a predator and now like in the wild and now you remember that through your dna is that mm -hmm. what is that why we resonate with sacred geometry what do you guys think hmm, that's a good question like what memory is it accessing like which level i think you know there's a lot of different levels you're talking about like a, a wild animal's often operating at a very purely bodily instinctual way, like because of that long species conditioning to be that type of species, you know, a, a deer gets spooked because it hears this noise, it's highly alert. Well, that's, that's built into that animal. I mean, that's how that animal has been for hundreds of thousands of years, probably, right? So mm. that's at the, that kind of gross kind of physical level, but it has a morphogenic type of field around it, you know, to be that animal the way it is, you know, it's kind of got that. But then, you know, there's other levels. There's the emotion, you know, beyond the physical, you've got this kind of emotional, you know, the subconscious type of level, the higher mental levels, the more spiritual levels, you know, what are those areas that we are also accessing memories from that are not just purely the physical uh physical yeah. organism right and you know i think it's really easy to brush that it needs to be you know, accounted for yeah you know where's where's the consciousness then you know is the consciousness this is a big question that science has been trying to figure out it's like consciousness just this human body this organism you know and once you're gone you know that that's the end of the consciousness or is it actually just a kind of container for that consciousness and that, you know, that consciousness isn't even personal, <laughs> you know, is it even really a personalized consciousness? If you go further and further up the spectrum <laughs> to mm -hmm. a real unified consciousness, like, so where are those boundaries that you're describing, you know, is it the skin, is it that aura, is it that kind of collective earth aura that we're in this whole, like, where's your boundary? You know, mm -hmm. that's that's one of the questions we're tra still trying to figure out, I guess. <laughs> uh, it's really fun listening to the scholars like go back and forth because it, it's bleeding into a lot of different fields like quantum physics and uh, fractal system mathematics are all getting in on the consciousness debate. Neurobiology is obviously involved in the consciousness debate. And uh, yeah, like. Uh, uh, thermodynamics is getting in on it you know like i mean there's all kinds of different fields converging on trying to solve what consciousness actually is uh, i follow a neurobiologist named daniel siegel and he's under the impression from how information speaks to him that uh the the sea of there's a there's a quantum void or a quantum vacuum that energy arises from 
it doesn't exist in that place because it's potential energy at that point. So, so he calls it the sea of potential, you know, but every single particle in the whole universe arises from that void, you know? And, mm -hmm. and so there's that singularity or that non dual state, uh, from what everything that exists arises from. And he thinks that's sort of the source and, uh, uh, what consciousness actually is and it you know and it, it's just taken your form you know temporarily you know um it's got to be energy and, and energy is infinite as far as we know you know it's like just because your body ends it ain't the end of you as far as what gave you life you know that doesn't go away for sure yeah no i think uh i think the one thing about the conversation though because i've thought i've contemplated this for years even when i was tracker i mean i've spent a lot of time you know thinking about these questions <laughs> and thinking is probably not the best way to go about it because <laughs> it, is the dog, it is the dog chasing its tail you know yeah and, and it really does i think come down to your own mysticism whatever that is your own mystical experience relationship and experience like the, the science and the mystic science and the mystic you know how they say they've come together like the old mystics of the past are actually describing what these theorists are trying to describe nowadays mm -hmm. they accessed it not really through all that but they understood it through their actual direct relationship that even if we understood fully what the scientists are saying about that it still is not going to mean anything to us because the real goal of the whole thing is to not understand it here but to become to embody to know uh, the truth of that the tr know the truth beyond the knowing here in the mind to the knowing that yeah that is the truth <laughs> even though you might not be able to explain it uh so you know it, you, it's easy to get lost on that end of the spectrum meaning the, mm -hmm. the how do we figure this out we'd love to but you know what even if we figured it out and someone had the perfect answer for you it's still not going to make you feel like you got anywhere because right. you want to yeah. no, no, you don't, you know, if <laughs> I, if I laid out the perfect best answer for you, if you don't know that <laughs> because yeah. of your direct experience, you won't recognize it. Never satisfy you. It will never satisfy you. It will never be, the mind yeah. will never be satisfied about it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's, it has That's to really be well. experiential. It has to be experiential without a doubt. <laughs> yeah I, I think you explained that perfectly that's like yeah it's like i mean, I mean that's very um you're reminding me of um because we that that got started because we were talking about consciousness and what you said reminded me of uh an alan watts quote i really like um he said uh trying to define yourself is like trying to bite your own teeth <laughs> and you said you know thinking about consciousness is like chasing a dog chasing its own tail like you're not yeah it's not gonna happen yeah yeah. The, yeah like you get into zen philosophy you know it's not something you conceive with your mind and words at all it's i don't know that's where i like the people that talk about vibrations you know because the vibration is something you experience and embody you know and i think the answers are more vibrational <laughs> Uh, yes yes and then once you get an answer you know it's always uh finite you see that's the that's the power of the now truthfully you know that's the mm -hmm. whole. because even if you got the answer in that moment and you did have your aha and you did feel all that bliss or enlightenment or whatever can happen mm -hmm. if you that was it you're already lost <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> that's know? a very buddhist well, mindset yeah well, because that i mean it, it doesn't have to be buddhist that's one way of describing oh, it but that really yeah. that that really is uh you know kind of back to the consciousness of putting the needle the repetitive act it's like you know the needle the compass needle and doing it it's like the moment it really is so much in that in that moment you know because even if we have our great epiphany you can't hold on to it there's nothing to really hold on to you know like that's really <laughs> an important thing and that's the same thing with understanding these super complex subjects that's why i like going into sacred geometry <laughs> because you're you know you're kind of connecting with all, all that sort of stuff and it's a momentary drawing that's happening in that moment you might completely forget about it afterwards you might put it on your wall and maybe not look at it all that much but you know when you were doing that you were there <laughs> yeah but yeah. It, it, it's a memory now on the wall 
but you um, can do it again. <laughs> you know, you can you can access that again. Uh, it's a ritual. Yeah. Feel yeah. the force, Luke. Yeah, like I like feeling the force when I turn the compass. You know, is it's this it's this whole <laughs> circular pressure and feeling the circle and the surface of the object and the resistance and like flowing with it and not wobbling or you know misguiding it i don't know it's a really enjoyable moment oh. and it's transformative though because just one last piece it's like if you just take that and only have that experience there and it means nothing else to the way you're moving through your time on earth here like in your other relationships well then you're missing the point of it <laughs> it's more than just doing that drawing it is changing you in that way and all those little awarenesses are very applicable to your relationships with others and the earth and things around you and choices you make it's like you're developing a conscious awareness you know oh let's talk about like this uh transformative hermetic process it, it reminds me of uh, my favorite book the alchemist there's a part mm -hmm. in where he is he's cleaning glass and he feels clean he feels like wholesome in this act of like making this glass shine it is like it's there there's something really true about that in in a in a um a menial task like uh i don't really know yeah how. he i can't describe it better than paulo coelho but he, yeah. he was cleaning himself when he cleaned the glass yeah yeah yeah, yeah. Like similar to what you guys are describing too yeah it reminds me, and I'm going to probably butcher the story a bit, but there is a Zen one that is about uh, two monks and the head of the monastery was about to leave and he was going to assign his next student, you know, to take over. And the one guy, you know, wrote on the wall in the morning, you know, it was there like this beautiful quote about the spotless mirror that he's been polishing. Mm -hmm. And then there was this janitor monk who was there, you know, who was just kind of doing menial chores. He wasn't the top student or anything like that. And all of a sudden, you know, he wrote on the wall, uh, you know, you know, where's the dust? Where's the mirror? <laughs> you know, like there wasn't even a mirror there to polish because the other guy was still thinking there was a mirror to polish or, or glass to polish. But this guy was so transparent, so translucent that the concept of even the mirror <laughs> wasn't even a part of the picture. And now the little menial <laughs> janitor all of a sudden became the head of the monastery. <laughs> And the guy took off, you know, the, the head monk took off and left this guy, the, the little janitor guy, as the head, new guy. And everybody was like up in arms because he was, in, he was the lowest guy on the rung. He wasn't the top guy, but he was the most present in his observations mm -hmm. to kind of get through that last boundary of what the mirror is. <laughs> mm -hmm. You know, kind of that last the thread of attachment. Mm -hmm. So that's another kind of Buddhist story that I remember. And I probably didn't tell that the best full perfect <laughs> version of that but i think you got the gist of that yeah that's very nice i like that <laughs> um so the hebrew literature uh they're writing the stories in circles uh through a technique called parallelism and uh like you know your journey starts and and you go through the day and night of your journey and uh they get circle storytelling from day and night you know the sun moves in a circle around the earth and comes back where it started and and it represents uh the character goes on a transformation through their day and night just like we are transformed every day and night ourselves and the whole world is is together in that transformation every day transforms every one of us and i don't know relating that to drawing circles in sacred geometry is just natural and beautiful uh, for sure well you know like it reminds me a lot of the medicine wheel teachings too you know because and that's from the native american traditions and because i was really into tracking i spent a lot of time with native american culture spent time with native americans learning a lot about ceremony and you know the concept of the medicine wheel with the directions the four directions and uh, mm -hmm. honoring the different directions it was all sacred geometry in a very applied ceremonial type of way where all the rocks and the significance and the layout of things, uh, the different altars that would be set up all had that very strong resonance to the seasonal cycles, you know, the day mm -hmm. cycle, like they all yep. overlap on the hoop. They were all transposed on one another. So mm -hmm. you're really in that medicine wheel as your whole life journey, as your day journey, yep. all overlapped. 
Yeah. Well, so that's really the framework in a very small snapshot that I gave you of like their relationship with their environment and with one another through these uh, yep. sacred geometric principles of the micro macro, you know, yeah. experience of the world, you know, so very, very well uh, uh, embodied by those cultures that I had some time to spend, spend a little time. With. Yeah, I've got a question about that. So it, it seems like, and it's my understanding too, that ancient cultures seem to be more in tune with these concepts. It seems like for the most part, we've kind of fallen out of touch with these ideas. And that obviously, you know, there are geometers keeping them alive. And, you know, it's not like, it's not like people don't talk about this stuff. But mm -hmm. I guess what I'm saying is it, it, it seems like it was more uh, a part of life um, mm -hmm. for may, maybe okay. unanimously, right? Like I, for everyone. I, I have a, a thought on that is that uh, paying attention to nature stopped being relevant to our, our, our survival in our society today. Like, like you can live indoors and make tons of money and never go in nature, never pay attention to that's any of it at all. That's interesting, Danny, because I was thinking like more, uh, I, I suppose, like nefarious conspiratorial reasons. But maybe it's as simple as that, is that we don't have to look at nature all day. Mm -hmm. And the fact that we don't have to, some people are going to choose not to. Mm -hmm. um, and things just get lost in time. That's actually an Occam's razor more simple conclusion yeah i mean i think that disconnection that you're talking about from nature is a pretty big piece it's part of the thing that i've been helping people with for a long time is bringing them back out to reconnect in those ways and you see quite a big transformation in life just from doing those types of uh out, out, outdoor settings so i think that's a big part of uh a big definitely a big part of it and, and also it did give the opportunity though you know to move away from just subsistence survival but a lot of these a lot of these cultures weren't just subsistence and survival like we think i mean they really had it dialed in you know <laughs> they had lived like this for a long time so they knew the plants they knew the herbs they weren't just all sitting around freezing in caves <laughs> you know yeah. they had gotten the flow with the harmony of the environment so they you know they were living in conjunction with it you know, and that's not the real, totally romanticized version of it, but, you know, they, they dialed it in to figure it out. Like, yeah, Egyptian culture, Canaanite culture, Greek and Roman culture, you know, Babylon, they, they were all uh, forms of government that were completely connected to the cycle of nature, you know? Yeah, and those some more sophisticated civilizations, if they yeah. maintain that thread of connection, well, then you have kind of like the renaissance of the arts, uh, you know, you have more of the connection from the naturalists and forming the science and it's all more unified. And what happened over time is a very much splitting and diversification in the educational system. You had very specialized people, not a lot of, much, not a lot of cross disciplinary stuff going on. Uh, you had more and more there separation more and more separation from nature everybody becomes more you know then, then all of a sudden things continue to escalate into everybody separate you know and that happened yeah. well before that there, <laughs> but it's a matter it's a reflection in the culture then that they're, they're finally the academic community is starting to break free from that they're realizing that integrating all of these separate uh uh avenues of academics is the way to get more answers you know uh, so a lot of separate fields are are starting to integrate and work together again, and um, and they're actually using uh, complex system mathematics to do it. So it's kind of this exciting thing. But, but yeah, yeah, that's yeah, totally. that's the that's the future. Uh, I was let me let me segue George and hit you with something a little different. Uh, <laughs> what um, what are your thoughts on free will? Uh, do you think we have control of our actions or is that kind of an antiquated idea? Uh, let's see. I think uh, we do have, you know, it's really, that's a really complicated question because I think in the big picture, like the really, really big picture. If you, you expand know, out all the way, it's like, yeah. I think you, 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 don't, you don't really have a choice in a lot of things, you know, and like I mean, the way we think we do. You know, I think some of our choices that we think we have it actually get in the way of experiencing a free will, because that is a free will in a not deterministic type of 
perspective. It's not definitely not deterministic, but you're part of something so much larger <laughs> than what we perceive through our limited lens, mm. you know? It, mm. And our limited lens thinks that it has that free will, like it has that power and control when, and it wants that. But what part of ourselves really is that that thinks that it has that? Okay. That's often the part that really gets us in trouble the most, you know? It's often the thing that makes the wrong choices in that situation is because it's not actually aligned with a will that's greater than ourselves, you know? So it's like, those are the choices we have that we, we feel like we can make. Um, and it's part of the learning and growth process, really, you know, to, to see how you begin to align with something that might be a little bit greater than yourself. You give up more of those uh, potential, the potential to give up more of what we consider our personalized will actually is very free. So mm. in, in, I don't know if that makes sense. I, but, I'm following you. Yeah. Okay. So, it, you know, I don't have a real uh, strict way to say a yes or a no. All I know, you know, through my own experience is that, you know, you alignment with a will that supersedes our own personal perspective desire will definitely puts one into alignment with a greater will that is in our own. And in that you're making some choices that might either go with that or not <laughs> at times. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh they call it regulating the flow of consciousness you know it's like uh we we have moments in our lives to where we get to like do a or b you know and which one like would be better you know what should be a better direction for time to go in you know if i choose a or b but like not every moment in your life is like that and you're subject to like a whole universe of forces you know, that a lot of times don't give you an option. You just have to be through mm -hmm. what comes your way. And like, you know, you can get philosophical at that point of like, if I just go with the flow, am I exercising free will or not? You know, mm -hmm. I think um, I actually completely agree, George, that like, it's not so cookie cutter determinism or free will. It's I think both of those concepts are um, lacking there's we i think we've we've yet to acquire a good way of thinking about it um and both of those are incorrect it's not there is something there is a driving force but also yeah. you are bombarded with all kinds of stimulus constantly that in, in affects the way you think and act um and so it, there's something going on weird there in the same way i have a, a problem with the way uh we as people communicate around the, the words real and imaginary. Um, <laughs> I think there, there's, that's, that's kind of a misunderstanding as well. Whereas like real in colloquial terms means he, like here in the terms of like physics, it happens. But mm -hmm. to say imaginary, I think is kind of failing because I think in a lot of the ways we discuss things that are imaginary, these things do exist. They just don't exist in the three-dimensional plane that we all inhabit. Yeah, but see, the thing is they can. You see, every product of sacred geometry came from your imagination. <laughs> you oh, see, yeah. Yeah. you know, when, you are, when you're making geometric forms, and I've made a lots like that are really based on the sacred geometry principles <laughs> that came from my imagination. And I made a 3D object out of it and it actually means something and it can apply it to something. And that's where your discoveries come from mm -hmm. <laughs> that you're mentioning, right? Yeah. So that, that is part of using your imagination. And it's, 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 not, uh, it's not something to write off that it's not real. Exactly. See, most okay. of our it's a lot like dreams. It's a lot like dreams. That's a good point energy forms that exist in our mind that communicate to us you know yeah i get what so is that <laughs> my dreams i get so much information i mean they really guide so much not just in sacred geometry but in all sorts of things different types of dreams you know um different levels of type of dreams experiences but you know i really pay attention to that stuff it's really parts of ourselves at these other levels that communicate that are tapping into this George consciousness that's sitting here now, <laughs> which is all mm -hmm. those levels at once, but the one that's really kind of in that state of yap, 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 it comes in and says, hey, wow, 
oh, that's something to pay attention to. And if you have that dream a few times, boy, that's something really to pay attention to. Maybe I'll make a choice about this thing that's really bothering me, you know, and maybe mm -hmm. I'll, and that happens, you know, you just have to develop that awareness uh, to, sure. to pay attention to it, not off override it because the rest of the dominant culture out there has downplayed the dream time, basically, you know, downplayed the imaginary state, downplayed yeah. that creativity from when most people were a little kid when they ever got told their first time, <laughs> you know, who are you talking to? You're, you don't see colors there or, you, you know, things like that, you know, mm -hmm. or automatically that kid slowly starts to shut off the abilities. Yep. That's a and, tragedy of our society. Mm -hmm. and, and you can night and day it with the ancient world and dreams and visions controlled the fate of nations, the lives of kings and conquest and war. Like, like, like you get into all of those ancient civilizations and like, that's what they're talking about. Like mm -hmm. dreams and visions controlling mm -hmm. reality. Yeah, it's not so. like it's history. I mean, people read this stuff, but all of a sudden in our day and age, you have somebody sitting outside with a vision and then you tell them you had a vision about this. People are like, you had a vision? You got to go over to hang out at this place for a few weeks. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know? yeah. Because yeah. people are just so freaked out about um, things that they feel are not normal. Like, where did normal come into the picture? Like, what is normal? You know, what, what, I call it boring. <laughs> I mean, there is definitely a way to kind of get too disconnected, you know, that you can't really, and there are routes to go that way, but it's, if there's guidance within community and culture that supports that sort of thing, rather than turning it into, you have a problem. Well, yeah. then some of these people are most brilliant geniuses waiting to bring in new information. Yeah. <laughs> It's off. You ever read Bentoff? It's off. It's off. Um, what's his name? Uh, Bentoff uh, wrote Stalking the Pendulum, Stalking the Wild Pendulum. Uh, well, it sounds uh, cool, but no, I haven't heard of it. Good book. I think you guys would probably really enjoy it. Uh, yeah, exploring yeah. Consciousness, Stalking the Wild Pendulum. I read it in my 20s. But I listened to an interview with him recently, and he was this old interview. It's like back in. 70s i mean they were wearing the funniest outfits and everything you know sitting there having this conversation about really deep spiritual things and the uh the guy uh bent off asked the interviewer he was like where do you think all the geniuses are right now and the, the interviewer was like uh well they're probably at our universities you know things like that and he's like no they're they're in our mental institutions pretty much mm. yeah. <laughs> you know He's like, if these people were able to actually integrate and were given the ability to kind of reach into that sphere they're working with and kind of, they would probably be the geniuses that are out there on the cutting edge of groundbreaking material. That's a great point. Like how much wasted potential is there in institutions like that, where it's like, this person does have... Um, some things that make them stand out from normal in our society. Um, but like they, they also have this great sea of potential in them for like, and it, it is a huge tragedy to see, uh, to see people lost that way. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, that I can't remember who it was by any means, but there was a, a monk who developed like kind of like, you know, a, a commune for people with schizophrenia and other types of mental illnesses uh, because he believed that they were actually shaman healers, you know? Mm -hmm. And so he would like, you know, take them in and then train them to be a healer and totally transform their lives. Yeah. Uh, and I, I a hundred percent agree with that uh, approach by all means. So yeah. Yeah. The well, mental health community is failing. I think uh, where, we, where we get in trouble in our society, like with the subjects we're talking about is like language is, is lacking for us. Like, yeah, we're, we're getting to a point where like English is not working. Um, we need to, <laughs> we need to invent some new words is what needs to happen. Uh, <laughs> or new, new, at least uh, new ways of thinking about it. Cause like, like I was talking about earlier, this, this idea of real and imaginary bothers me because it's not sufficient. And I think, um, Danny, what you brought up earlier about potential, potential mm -hmm. is a much, much better way of looking at that. Whereas like yeah. things here, 
versus things that could be here. Like you were saying, George, mm -hmm. all those, all that geometry existed in this place and mm -hmm. we discovered it and bring it forth into this world. So it's like, it has the potential to be here and it exists before we found it. Um, I think that's a much better way of looking at it. And maybe we can rephrase um, like the way, re restructure the way we look at other things too. And I think that would really help our society, like mm -hmm. mental illness, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it's really like relaxing the flexibility around the label, you know, because it might not be the word so much. It might actually be the attachment and association with the word <laughs> That once you say that, all of a sudden you kind of just lock in on that and that's what it is. See, maybe the word isn't, you know, maybe it's not actually that thing. Maybe there's a way to kind of be a little bit more malleable with uh, what that interpretation of that might be. But mm -hmm. see, that comes to a new level of consciousness to be able to, like I posted earlier today, be able to hold a few different perspectives at once, you know? That, yeah. that was an awesome post, George. <laughs> you know, I, I posted yeah, I love that. icosahedron from three different perspectives all on top of each other. And mm -hmm. really, I was basically saying, the more we're able to hold these different perspectives all kind of at once in our consciousness really gives us the ability to not just see it from one view. Yeah. <laughs> and that, that to me is really kind of the most simplistic way forward is uh, with all the labels, with all the attachment, with all the meanings associated with things, all, you know, how do you like break out of that and actually see another view or see a different perspective and be able to hold that with yours and discover something that's maybe in between them? That, that's simple gymnastics. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it, I, I deal with it commonly because I, I do speak to people about religion, like, and my focus is like on their state of consciousness and uh, everybody can hear words a little different and words mean different things to different people. So like it's not necessarily about the words when I talk to people, but about the experience that they're having, you know, and and like so I'm feeling their heart and their mind open up and resonate with language and, and tuning into them, mm -hmm. you know, like and and that seems to be the answer to the problem you're talking about with language, Alex. And it's funny that your post, George, like it, it really expresses that exact thing, you know, mm -hmm. like as a word it can have different forms to different people you know and like it's yeah. about tuning in to what they see you know it's the word and it's also like what we see you know you see some see somebody and all of a sudden you have an idea that comes in the mind because of what they're wearing or what they're walking or talking or you know like, like all that stuff happens so subtly and it, it can easily uh have your years of perspective and fears or joy or whatever comes up like that's the type of stuff to be like come sensitive to like because that's filtering that's the filters right that's the screen yeah. that's going over our awareness of how we're seeing things around us mm -hmm. right and it happens yeah. so fast we can't get out of it <laughs> easily <laughs> because as soon as yeah. i look and see a cup i see you know the decahedron i bam 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 labeling 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 <laughs> but you know can you hold it as maybe it's something else if i turn it this way you know can i see it a little different and be open that's really i think the key word is, is working in openness you know figuring out what that is yeah we're not figuring it out just experiencing it and letting that communicating communicating with it you know you know i just want to say like this is such a pivotal time in history to be alive right now um we're at a very it's 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 weird it's weird to be alive <laughs> At this point in time, um, you know, we're more interconnected uh, through the Internet than we've ever been before um, and through travel like we have airplanes and boats and stuff. And it's like on this one hand, we're more intelligent than we've ever been. And on the other hand, we're dumber than we've ever been. And uh, I guess, you know, there's a question in here somewhere, I guess, George, what do you are you optimistic? Are you pessimistic? Are you realistic? What what do you think about the future? Uh, you know, I, I think, uh, I, I focus on, you know, being, being, following, uh, the gifts that have come through me, like, like, how do I show up in the world? That's like really all I can do, you know, in the big picture of it, you know, cause I see a lot of 
tragedies out there. You know, you see a lot of really good things. We've gone through some really hard times. It is pivotal. But I guess all I could really do is like, how am I showing up? You know, and like, what vibe am I putting out? You know, because those are huge things. But if I feel like I found that place where uh, I could put out that vibe, maybe lift up a little excitement in someone else or inspire them in a different way through my inspiration, you know, more inspire someone with our inspiration, they get the spark of inspiration, whether it's through sacred geometry or some other interest that helps build those bridges of connection. And that's what we really kind of need. But the only way that's going to happen really is each of us have to kind of stand up a little bit, you know, kind of be like own it, own yeah. that brightness inside ourselves, or whatever you want to call it and kind of just put it out there, <laughs> you know, let, let go of the fears that get in the way of kind of shining your light and, you know, come from the heart, speak from the heart or the mind or find the balance inside yourself, work on the things that need to be healed with inside, see where your attachments and the, you know, separations are in your own life, you know, do the inner work, you know, because that's part of the outer work. Yeah. That's like really the only thing that I think anybody can do. I mean, I think it's great to go out and make all the changes, but once you find that inner thing, those changes will start to come to you and you'll be acting from that place. You know, you don't have to, you don't have to go like super hard and be like evangelical, you know, evangelical about it or like try to make a huge, big impact change. Like, cause you could do all that and still have not done any inner work on yourself, you know, Absolutely. It's just like outer work, you know, yeah. which is useful and good, but it really has got to be a critical uh, inner inner evaluation and healing that goes on. That's where I think the really things are going to yeah. multiply. Yeah, M Michael Jackson had something relevant to this about a man in a mirror. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, it, it that's it has to start there. I mean, it, you're like like you said, actually, it doesn't have to start there, but uh, to make the most effective real change, it has to start there. I think so, because then all we're doing is looking outside of ourselves, right? And then it's easy to do that. And, you know, if, but if you start show, you know, if I start showing up, because I can only speak for myself in this, not you, <laughs> no. you know, but I know the little things that I'm doing that feel like, oh, I can wake up a little more feeling positive today. So I'm going to, I'll put this post out that speaks to something about, you know, feeling, seeing things from all perspectives. And maybe that, you know, I, I'm feeling that maybe someone else will resonate with that. Maybe when they're walking around, they'll see things from different perspectives, you know, and you feel like you're adding a little bit to it, but you can only really say that because you're feeling like connected to that in a way, mm -hmm. you know? So, because that's the change that I'm integrating. So, you know, don't be afraid to share the change that you're going through because that's that, that interchange is what might spark another person's interchange. Especially since yeah. so many of us are afraid to do that. It's like, you know, if you don't, you know, it's like a huge tragedy on the world because so many people need that. Exactly. Yeah, no, that, that's what I hope to inspire with the, at least the new geometers work is to overcome all those little fears and whether it's through sacred geometry or anything else, that's my target that I'm in now is I've seen so many people in my apprenticeships and whatnot overcome those little things and you see the light come on they're super excited they're like why am i feeling so much more joy and they're sharing that with other people you know either their artwork and it's like well i didn't do anything the geometry really kind of for them was a thing that helped be that catalyst yeah and uh you know that's that's inspiring and i and i think that little things like that are helping to raise people up in these little incremental ways till we kind of start to hit that tipping point and you know it starts younger generations get more growing up with that and it, it, it will happen you know that i trust and have faith in that or else then i would just put my head completely under a rock yeah <laughs> and you just want to hide out from it and yeah. that it's going that way i i completely agree with you um uh, when i when i say this i mean this um i guess as metaphorically as i do literally but um I, I worship Prometheus and the Greek god Prometheus um, handing down the torch to humanity against Zeus's will. He was punished for that, um, but he hands man fire. Um, and to me, I, I, I worship this process of the handing down of knowledge. So it, it's actually kind of a trinity in a, in a way I think about it, where it's um, the teacher, the knowledge itself and the student. So. Mm -hmm. Um, that, that is at the core 
of my philosophy. And I, I basically, I say this to say, George, you're doing really great work. And um, I respect and have a lot of appreciation for what you're doing. Oh, I love that. Thank you. I really appreciate that too. I'm so happy you had me on here, Danny. Thanks for the invite. It was really a lot of fun to uh, hang out with you guys. I don't know if that was our kind of segue to wrapping up. We got on about an hour and a half. Yeah, we we, unfortunately we have reached the end of our time, um, but this has been such a pleasure. We we just barely scratched the surface. There is so much more you can learn, Alice, about geometry, um, new geometry on on YouTube and new geometers on Facebook. Please go check out George Leoniak and all he has going on. All right. Thanks so much, guys. That was a lot of fun. Hope to see you. Yeah. Likewise. Yeah. Thank you, George. I appreciate you being here, man. All right. Awesome. Thanks.